Well, hey everybody, I'm Adam Shell, the pastor at Melbourne Heights, and I want to welcome you as we come together to worship online this morning. And as we get started, I want to encourage you to engage with us throughout our time together. You can get started right now if you're worshiping with us on Facebook or on YouTube by sharing this post. And by sharing this post, you'll be inviting your friends to come and worship with us and to come and worship with you this morning. You can also engage with us if you're worshiping with us on Facebook by using those emojis. So don't be afraid to hit one of those if you like something that was said or if you love one of the songs that we sung or even if something happens that makes you laugh out loud. You can also engage with us through the comments thread on Facebook or on YouTube. You can ask questions, make comments that you have, and I want you to know that if you do have questions that you post, I take a little bit of time every Monday on our church's private Facebook group to answer those questions. You can join that group at facebook.com slash groups slash Melbourne Heights. I also want to let you know that today we are wrapping up the sermon series that we have been working our way through on life lessons from the prophet Elijah. And in today's sermon, we're going to hear a difficult story where the king of Israel during Elijah's lifetime does something unthinkable, something that is more fitting for a villain in a superhero movie than a character in God's story. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. Before we get to that, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Leslie Brocklesby and our church musicians as they lead us in worship through song. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for the time that we have today to just come together and to worship you, God. And we are so thankful that you are God, that you are so great, that you can reach out and speak to us wherever we are, God. It doesn't matter right now that we're worshiping online and that some of us are sitting in our bedrooms or we're in our offices or we're in our kitchens, our living rooms, or any place else, God. Because you can reach out. You can bring us all together to worship you and to glorify your name. So God, allow us to enjoy being in your presence and speak to us today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Let's praise the Lord together. God is greater, our God is stronger. 
There are some days that change the world immediately. Days that we know were significant before the clock even strikes midnight. These days are days like October 29th, 1929, the day that the stock market crashed. Or days like December 7th, 1941, a day that will live on in infamy because it's when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Or days like November 22nd, 1963, the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Or days like July 20th, 1969, the day that mankind first walked on the moon. 
But there are other days that change the world forever, take us a little longer to realize. Those days are days like November 18, 1928. And although no one could have imagined it at the time, that day was the beginning of a new kingdom in our world. And this kingdom would be built on cartoon characters and children's dreams. It was truly a magical kingdom that was built around a mouse named Mickey who made his debut on that November day. These days are days like May 25th, 1977. On that day, audiences were transported to a galaxy far, far away. And when they returned to their regular lives two hours later, everything had changed. Before long, people were dressing up like Wookiees and a Sith Lord named Darth Vader. And now, more than 40 years later, the Star Wars film franchise has grossed more than $10 billion, and it's changed the entertainment industry forever. There's days like December 31st, 2019. It was on that day that the Wuhan Municipal Health Commission reported a cluster of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan, Hubei province in China. It would later be determined that that cluster of cases of pneumonia was actually a novel coronavirus. And I think we all know how much that coronavirus has changed our lives since that December day. These are days like June 2nd, 1932. And what exactly happened on that day? Well, it wasn't a day when some famous cartoon character made his debut. And it wasn't a day when an act of violence shook our nation or our world to its core. And it wasn't a day when an unknown virus began to spread across the globe. The truth is that June 2nd, 1932 was a pretty typical Thursday for just about everyone. Everyone, that is, except the Siegel family. At 810 that Thursday night, Mitchell Siegel was hard at work in his second-hand clothing store on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. Mitchell had immigrated to the United States from Lithuania years earlier, and he was busy chasing after the American dream. But when the Great Depression hit a couple years earlier, it nearly ended those dreams once and for all for Mitchell and a whole lot of other people. That's actually why Mitchell had ended up where he was with the second-hand clothing shop. He was running that shop because new clothes were just too expensive for most people to be able to buy. And it looked like June 2nd was gonna be a good day for Mitchell to be in business. Even as his workday was winding down at 8 o'clock that night, Mitchell had three new customers that came walking through the doors of his shop. Soon, one of those customers was asking to see one of the suits that Mitchell had on display and for sale. But as soon as Mitchell turned his back to help another one of the gentlemen that had come into his shop, the guy who asked to see that suit, well, he was making a mad dash for the door with his suit in hand. In the commotion of the robbery gone bad, gunshots were fired. And when all the dust settled and all the smoke cleared, Mitchell Siegel was left dead at the age of 60. Mitchell left behind his wife and six children that day, and they all struggled to make sense out of this tragedy, wondering, why would anyone want to rob their father? Or why did those men have to hurt him in the process? Or why didn't someone step in to help him out? As a 17-year-old boy, Mitchell's youngest son, named Jerry, couldn't help but fixate on that last question. Why didn't someone step in to help his dad? I mean, there were eyewitnesses to the whole event, but no one stepped forward to try to save a dying man. The more Jerry thought about it, the more he came to believe that what the world needed was someone who would step in. What the world needed was someone who would stand up for the little guy. What the world needed was someone who would help the helpless. What the world needed was a hero. What the world needed was a hero. The kind of hero who always did the right thing. The kind of hero who never backed down when another person was in need. The kind of hero could, who, who could inspire each of us to be better human beings. The kind of hero that would end up plastered on t-shirts and tin lunchboxes, with a matching thermos, of course. The kind of hero who would be able to sell out movie theaters come the 1970s. The kind of hero that would cause fans to demand the release of the Snyder Cut 
in the 2020s. The kind of hero who is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. What the world needed was Superman. And even though Jerry Siegel and his best friend Joe Schuster wouldn't actually create their first story and sketches of the Man of Steel for at least another year, and even though it would take another six years before they eventually sold their story to DC Comics, in a lot of ways, June 2nd, 1932 was the birth date for Superman. And the truth is, these two high school students probably couldn't have come up with a better time to create the world's first superhero. You see, the 1930s was one of the darkest times in our nation's history. Our nation was entrenched in the Great Depression with an unemployment rate of almost 25%. And because unemployment rates were so high, the crime rate was skyrocketing as a lot of men turned to petty theft just to put food on their tables, and women turned to prostitution so they could pay their bills. The 30s was also the time when Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany. And as Jewish immigrants living in the United States, the Siegels and the Schusters families undoubtedly heard from their relatives and their friends that were still living in Europe about Hitler's genocidal agenda. Add to this the onset of the most severe drought in our nation's history, which caused thousands of families to be displaced all across the Midwest. You start wondering why someone didn't come up with Superman a whole lot sooner. There was poverty. There was violence. There was oppression. There was injustice. People across our nation and around the world had lost everything from their loved ones to their own land. So it's easy to see that the world needed a superhero. But the truth is, the world needed a superhero long before the last son of Krypton ever hoisted up that two-ton car over his head on the Action Comics number one that he debuted in. That's what we've seen as we've been exploring some of the stories from the prophet Elijah's life over the last few weeks. Now, we've been exploring some stories from the life of Elijah because the world that we're living in right now in 2020, well, it isn't that different than the world that Elijah lived in 2,900 years ago. So by looking at his life, we can learn lessons that will help us when our fortunes change and we face difficult times in our lives. So, just to remind you, Elijah's story takes place about 2,900 years ago, while a man named Ahab was the king of Israel. But things don't go real well for the people of Israel while Ahab is sitting on the throne. But the people of Israel aren't very far removed from the golden era of their nation either. When Ahab's reign began, grandparents in Israel, they would have been telling their grandkids stories about how great things were under King David and under King Solomon. But things were great under King David and under King Solomon because both of those guys, they followed God. But Ahab didn't. So God sends a prophet named Elijah to straighten King Ahab out. And that's largely what prophets do inside of the Bible. The prophets were like the warning alarms for ancient Israel. So if the people started relying on themselves too much and they started turning their backs on God, prophets would show up who would warn them to change course before it was too late. And in the story that we're going to read today, we'll see that Elijah will have a lot to warn Ahab about. In this story, we'll hear about poverty, violence, oppression, and injustice. And before this story ends, we'll all wish that there was a superhero that could have swooped in to save the day. So let's listen to this story from 1 Kings chapter 21. We'll start reading in verse 1. Here's what it says. Now there was a man named Naboth from Jezreel, who owned a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. One day Ahab said to Naboth, Since your vineyard is so convenient to my palace, I would like to buy it to use as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I will pay you for it. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. So Ahab went home, angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face to the wall, and he refused to eat. 
What's the matter? His wife Jezebel asked him. What's made you so upset that you're not eating? I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused, Ahab told her. Are you the king of Israel or not? Jezebel demanded. Get up, eat something, and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent them to the elders and other leaders of the town where Naboth lived. In her letters, she commanded, Call the citizens together for a time of fasting, and give Naboth a place of honor. And then seat two scoundrels across from him, who will accuse him of cursing God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and other town leaders followed the instructions Jezebel had written in the letters. They called for a fast and put Naboth at a prominent place before the people. Then the two scoundrels came and sat down across from him, and they accused Naboth before all the people, saying, He cursed God and the king. So he was dragged outside the town and stoned to death. The town leaders then sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, You know the vineyard that Naboth wouldn't sell you? Well, you can have it now. He's dead. So Ahab immediately went down to the vineyard of Naboth to claim it. You know, this is the kind of story that just makes you feel sick to your stomach when you hear it. In this story, all that Naboth wants to do is to honor his heritage by keeping the land that his forefathers had passed down to him. This was likely the land that his ancestors had received when the people of Israel returned to the promised land after their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But King Ahab, he wants this land for himself. So he goes to Naboth and he asks him for the land. But instead of taking Naboth's no for an answer or even trying to continue negotiations to buy it from him, the king goes back home sulking like a toddler that has just been sent to time out. Then, in the midst of his kingly temper tantrum, the king's wife, Jezebel, she shows up and she comes up with a plan that will make her husband happy. The only catch is that her plan will require shedding innocent blood to accomplish it. So that's exactly what happens. Naboth is murdered because the king of Israel wanted his land and because Naboth refused to give it up. Naboth is murdered because the queen of Israel abused her husband's power and called for Naboth's execution. Naboth is murdered because in the eyes of his queen, his life mattered less than her husband's happiness. And as King Ahab arrives in Jezreel to claim his ill-gotten land, I wish that Superman would have swooped right down beside him and sent Ahab back to his palace with his tail tucked between his legs. But Superman doesn't show up in this story. Another hero does. So let's listen to the rest of this story. We'll pick back up in verse 17. Here's what it says. But the Lord said to Elijah, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel, claiming it for himself. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Must you rob him too? Because you have done this, dogs will lick your blood at the very place where they lick the blood of Naboth. So my enemy... You, f you found me, Ahab exclaimed to Elijah. Elijah answered, I have come because you have sold yourself to what is evil in the Lord's sight. So now the Lord says, I will bring disaster on you and consume you. Okay, so the final words of this passage would probably sound more appropriate if they were coming from the mouths of some supervillain in a comic book instead of from God. But there is clearly a reason why God says, I will bring disaster on you and consume you, to Ahab. During this series, we've learned that 1 Kings 16.33 tells us that Ahab did more things to make the Lord, the God of Israel, angry than all other kings before him. And in this story, 
we see Ahab's power used to oppress and kill an innocent man. But there's more to the righteous anger of God in this passage than just the evil behavior of Ahab. You see, King Ahab was supposed to be Israel's superman. Ahab was supposed to be the one that was standing up for truth, justice, and the Lord's way. Ahab was supposed to be defending the poor. Ahab was supposed to be the one ending oppression. Ahab was supposed to be the one who was correcting injustice. Ahab was supposed to be the one who was bringing peace to his land. But instead of being Superman, Ahab was the supervillain. Instead of caring for the people he ruled over, Ahab only cared about himself. Instead of wanting the best for the people of Israel, Ahab only wanted the best for himself. Ahab wanted more land for himself. Ahab wanted more money for himself. Ahab wanted more, well, he just wanted more of whatever he could get for himself. And Ahab wasn't content with all that God had blessed him with. And that caused Ahab to become the villain of this story instead of the hero. And the truth is we let the exact same thing happen to ourselves. We become so consumed with getting exactly what we want that we become the exact thing God doesn't want us to be. We become selfish instead of selfless. We become greedy instead of generous. We become complainers instead of being charitable. We become crabby instead of cooperating. When we only focus on ourselves, we become the villain instead of the hero. When we only focus on ourselves, we become the villain instead of the hero. And as we've lived through the COVID-19 pandemic for the last six months, there have been plenty of times when we focused on ourselves and what we each want instead of thinking about how we can take care of each other. We've seen it. We've seen it when we've complained about businesses being shut down or mask mandates being put into place or school's decision to start this year virtually instead of in person. We focused on what we want for ourselves instead of focusing on how we can take care of each other. And you know what? God didn't create you to focus on yourself. God didn't create you to focus on yourself. That's not who God created you to be. God created us to be the presence of Jesus in a world that needs a real hero. God created us to be heroes who bring light where there is darkness. God created us to be heroes that bring hope where there is despair. God created us to, bring he to be heroes that bring joy where there is sorrow. God created us to be heroes that bring peace where there is chaos. God created us to be heroes that bring love where there is hate. God created us to be heroes that remind the world that God is always with us. Even when the drama in our lives and in our world feels like it could be ripped from the pages of a comic book. So when we start putting what we want ahead of what others need, we need to take a step back. And we need to remember just how much God has blessed our lives. And sure, we don't have as much as King Ahab did, but God has given most of us more than enough to be content. We have food on our tables. We have clothes on our backs. We have a roof over our heads. We have friends and family that love and care for us. Most of us don't need to wish for more because God has already given us plenty. So it may be true, that on June 2nd, 1932, Jerry Siegel and his family needed a superhero. The kind of hero who always did the right thing. The kind of hero who never backed down when a person was in need. The kind of hero who could inspire each of us to be better human beings. But we don't need Superman. We already have a hero. We have found a hero who compels us to do the right things. We have found a hero who calls us to serve people that are in need. We have found a hero who inspires us to live sacrificially for each other, just like he did for us. But you have to make the choice. Will you choose to live like Ahab? Will you choose to put yourself first and everyone else last? 
Or will you choose to live like Jesus? Will you choose to put others first? So will you choose to be the villain? Or will you choose to be the hero? Because ultimately, that's the choice that will define us as we face uncertain times and a change in fortune in our lives. We can allow these uncertain times and these changes of fortune to bring out the worst of us as we try to only take care of ourselves, or we can allow it to bring out the best of us when we reach out and care for one another. But you get to choose. Are you going to be the villain in this story? Or are you going to be the hero that God made you to be? Let's pray together. God, as we come to you now in this time of prayer, we just thank you for the time that we spent over the last few weeks exploring these stories from the life of Elijah God. You know that Elijah lived in a time not unlike what we've been experiencing so far this year. A time where Israel was coming out of their golden era and entering into a more tumultuous season in their history. And God, we've seen how Elijah lived out his faith, how he kept going even as his fortunes changed God. And ultimately, Elijah became the hero that the people of Israel needed. Someone who was there to help them, to stand up, to, in the face of oppression and wrong and injustice that was happening in this world, God. Someone who was there to speak your word and to show your love to others. God, my prayer for each of us as we continue to live through this tumultuous season in our lives is that you let us be the heroes too. Let us be the ones who will stand in to take care of those who are hurting. Let us be the ones who will speak up in the face of injustice and oppression. Let us be the ones who will serve you, who will be your light in the darkness of this world. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point in the service each week, we put this slide up on the screen to let you know how you can financially support our church. And we also take this time to remind you of the work in the ministry that our church is doing right now. Of course, throughout this pandemic, our primary focus in ministry has just been staying in touch with you. So myself, the rest of our staff, and our deacons are trying to make regular phone calls, send emails, text messages, even letters in the mail, just to check up and see how you're doing. We've also started our private Facebook group that we use as a place where we can connect during the week, where we can share what God is doing in our lives and ask for prayer as well. And we also continue our relationship with the Cabbage Patch Settlement House. The Cabbage Patch House works with over a thousand and at-risk kids in our community every single year. And our church has partnered with them for several years to keep the pantry there stocked. So right now we are collecting non-perishable food items as well as personal hygiene items to help out with the pantry at the patch. So let me encourage you to prayerfully consider how you might financially support our church and then you can visit mhbclouisville.com give. Now, let me turn it back over to Leslie and our church musicians as they lead us in our closing song.
Before we go, I just want to take a second to thank you for joining us for worship today. It means so much to us that you spent part of your day with us. And if you've been blessed by our time together, let me encourage you to share this post if you haven't done so already. I also want to let you know that today is the last time that we will be worshiping together in our current building. Now, yes, I know that we haven't actually been in our building for more than six months, but recently we finalized the sale on this building, something that we have been working on for three years because our church realized that the cost of owning and maintaining this building was keeping us from following the calling that God has for our congregation. So starting next Sunday, you're going to see myself and our instrumentalists in a different environment, but we're still going to be here worshiping together online. So you can join us next Sunday at 1030 a.m. on our church's website, on Facebook, or on YouTube, and I look forward to seeing you there. And next week, we are starting into a brand new series of sermons where we're going to be exploring some of Jesus' parables together. So we hope that you'll join us then. You can also join us every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. for a midweek devotional, as well as on Saturday mornings at 1030 30 a.m. for a special kids time. And don't forget you can also be a part of our small groups that meet every Sunday morning. So until the next time we get together, let me close us out in a word of prayer. God, we do thank you for the time that we've had together to worship you today. And we thank you for the reminder that we've had that you have created us to be heroes in your story, God. So allow us to find ways that we can bring your light into darkness, that we can show your love where there is hatred, that we can bring peace where there is chaos and joy where there is sorrow, God, and hope where there is despair. So as we go from this place, let us be heroes for you this week. Watch over us, protect us, keep us healthy, and keep us safe. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope that you guys have a great week, and we will see you back here next Sunday for another time to worship together.